Well, remarkably, we're now into the month of October, which kind of came as a shock to me when that happened. Um, and at the end of this month, it's um, a significant birthday or anniversary for the United Nations. Can anybody guess? This will get, kind of get the, the brains ticking. Can anyone guess how many years it is since the United Nations was formed? Any ideas? It's all very quiet. Oh, it's 75 years, okay, at the end of this month since the United Nations was formed. Um, it, it, it was formed in the aftermath of World War II. Fifty nations came together to sign a treaty. And, and the chief aim, really, of the United Nations has, has always been for international peace. And actually, during the second half of the 20th century, among many people, there was a great optimism for a new humanity. Part of that optimism lay in kind of these big political ventures, like the, the United Nations or the European Union. Uh, part of that optimism was in technology. You know, as things developed, uh, you know, the, the assumption was it would sort out lots of our problems. Well, we're now at the stage where the United Nations has 193 member states. Okay, nearly everybody has signed up. So surely now we've made it. Surely now we've got peace and unity. Well, in 2020, that's not the case, is it? For all of our politics, for all of our technology, our world is still marked by hostility and separation. If you've been following the, the election um, in the US, you can see that. Some of you might have watched or kind of read about um, the debate between Trump and Biden. You know, it was hostile, wasn't it? Full of name calling. And, and actually behind that, there's deep division in the US at the moment, isn't there, as a nation? We feel that in the tension at the moment between China and the West. We feel that in Brexit, don't we? You know, there's a division now, not just between us and the rest of Europe, but actually between us within ourselves as a nation. We felt that hostility and separation in the Black Lives Matter protests. We felt it here in Bradford, haven't we, with all the COVID stuff and how we've responded. There's been a lot of finger pointing and communities divided. And we feel that hostility and separation in our own lives, don't we? at a personal level. Husbands and wives, maybe, who can't look at one another in the eye. Parents who haven't spoken to their children for years. Old friends who've long fallen out. Is there any hope in all that? You know, what, what's God doing about all of this? Well, th this morning, we're continuing in the book of Ephesians, and at this stage, we're really starting to get into the heart of Paul's letter, and this morning, we're going to see that God is in the business of bringing people together. But the focus of his master plan is not the United Nations, but the cross of Jesus Christ. God, God does have big plans for a new humanity. But if you want to see them at work, actually, we need to take our eyes off global politics and look at the church. So let's read. Um, we're in Ephesians 2. Let me read from verse 11 um, down to verse 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together 
to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. It's a wonderful passage, isn't it? And um, our culture today loves stories of inclusion, doesn't it? You've probably picked that up. You know, stories where the outcast and the ostracized are welcomed in and become part of something great. You know, think of recent films like The Greatest Showman or X-Men or Spider-Man. And it's easy to think this is all some kind of modern story. But actually, what we've just read in Ephesians 2 is the greatest story of inclusion ever told. You know, um, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, he used to, to speak about how all of our little stories that we tell in some way point to the great story, the true story of what God is doing in our world. And it starts here with separation. So we see that in verses 11 to 13, separated, cut off from God and one another. Now, human beings, we've always built walls of hostility, haven't we? Walls to keep people out, to keep people separated. So there should be a picture coming up. Think of Hadrian's Wall, you know, um, not much further north of here, um, to keep the, built to keep the Scots out. Or think of the Berlin Wall, you know, built right through the middle of that city um, to divide East and West Germany. Or think of Trump's Wall, you know, built more, more recently um, to keep immigrants from coming up through Mexico. You know, these, we, they're all over the world, aren't they? These walls of hostility. But as Paul writes here, he has one particular wall in mind. And it's a wall within Herod's temple in Jerusalem. Um, so there's a picture, I think, coming up. This is a kind of artist reconstruction of what the, the, the temple would have looked like back then. This Herod's reconstruction in the first century was one of the biggest building projects of the time. It was colossal. A few years ago, um, Alice and I had the privilege of spending a bit of time in Jerusalem, and we went to Temple Mount. Now, the, the buildings have all gone, but the, the kind of area, the platform is still there. And just from that, you get a sense of the size and the scale and its prominence in the city of the grandeur. And to the Jewish people, the, the temple was a symbol of God's presence, of access to God. Now, the wall that Paul has in mind, if you look at that picture, you can kind of see right at the heart of the temple is the Holy of Holies, you know, where just the high priest could go. And then around that, you get the in, sort of inner courts. And actually, the Jewish people could generally go into that area. And then if you look, you can kind of see steps leading down into a bigger courtyard. And kind of halfway across that bigger courtyard is a little wall, a low wall. And that divided the court of the Gentiles from the inner part of the temple. So if you were a Gentile, a non-Jew, that's as far as you could go. And that wall was about kind of a metre and a half high. And it was a, you know, a symbol of this division, a barrier. And actually, all along, maybe there's another picture, I think, which just shows another kind of impression of it. So you see, again, halfway across, there's that wall. And the big division in society of that day was Jew and Gentile. And actually, along the wall were these little signs. You know, they were, they were actually carved in stone, and some of them have been found. So this is one, I think, that's in a museum in, in Turkey. And they're written in Greek, but this is the, the translation. No foreigner may enter within the barrier and enclosure around the temple. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. So it's a pretty serious wall, wasn't it, this? And um, this, was, you know, this wall was a symbol of the barrier between Jews and Gentiles. And one of the big things that differentiated Jew and Gentile were the requirements of the law that the, the Jews would keep. So circumcision, or the rituals of cleanliness, or the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices. And instead of the law being something that kind of was used to show who God was and to welcome people in, the Jewish people of that day were using the law to exclude the Gentiles. So in our passage, we saw that name calling, didn't we? You know, they called them the uncircumcised. But, and and it, this, it, this wasn't just a kind of petty squabble. So actually, there were reports back then that, that, that Jewish people would speak of the Gentiles as created by God to fuel the fires of hell. So it's a pretty serious division, isn't it? And that in some contexts, it was unlawful to help a Gentile mother in her hour of need because that would help bring another Gentile into the world. And another place talked about it, when a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl, the funeral of the Jewish boy was carried out. This is serious division between these two communities. But that wall wasn't just showing the barrier between Jew and Gentile. It was showing the barrier between, and the hostility between the Gentiles and God. They couldn't get in, could they? 
You know, they could only look from a distance. That they weren't members of the covenant, God's wonderful promises to his people. They didn't have access to God. The law condemned them. And there was nothing they could do about that. Verse 12 is Paul's summary. At that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. It's pretty bleak, isn't it? Now, if, I don't know what you make of that. It might be as I start speaking about Herod's temple and Jews and Gentiles, you know, this all feels like a, a, a long-forgotten world. But actually, outside Christ, nothing has changed. Without Christ, this is our default position, separated from one another and separated from God. And actually, outside of Jesus, those walls will always be there. So think of the, the place that you live. You know, for many of us, that's Bradford. It might be Leeds or, or Keithley, Huddersfield. Well, outside of Jesus, people are without hope and without God in the world. This is the big problem in our world, isn't it? Yes, we're separated from one another, but at root, there's a, there's a more serious separation. We're separated from God. And the good news of Ephesians is that God has made a way to heal those divides, to bring us together again. And it, it's not through an international political organization. It's not through some new economic program. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. The passage now speaks about reconciliation in verses 14 to 18. A new humanity united through the cross of Christ. So look at verse 14 if you've got a Bible in front of you. For he himself is our peace, who made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. Now what, what does Paul mean here when he says he's destroyed the barrier? He's not primarily talking about now that, that physical wall in the temple coming down. That physical wall in the temple did come down, you know, when the temple was destroyed in AD 70. But here, Paul is writing eight years before that happened. Actually, what God has done is far more radical. See, through the cross, God has made the whole temple system redundant. Jesus has opened a new and a better way to come to God. See, that barrier is, was a symbol of hostility, wasn't it? And what's the root of our hostility with God? Well, it's his right anger at our sin, at our wrongdoing. The law condemns us, rightly condemns us. You know, th this morning, I went for a little walk around Lister Park near where we live. And as you walk around the pond, there's often kind of, well, there are lots of ducks. and There's also quite a lot of rats. I think they're connected as people feed the ducks. But, you know, I walked along, and as I was walking along, a rat kind of scurried out into the bushes, you know, as soon as I drew near. And it just made me think, that's how it should be with us and God, isn't it? We're unclean. We're not fit to be in his presence. We should scurry away if ever we get near. But at the cross, Jesus took that anger on himself. He faced the condemnation we deserve. You know, peace always comes at a cost, doesn't it? That's what we remember on the 11th of November every year in terms of the Second World War. Well, the cost of our peace with God was the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfills the law's demand in our place. Now, this, that also means that all those things that distinguish Jew from Gentile no longer mattered. All those animal sacrifices, well, they were pointing in the end to the true sacrifice. See, at the cross, Jesus offered himself as the great sacrifice in our place. There's no need to sacrifice animals anymore. All those cleaning rituals, again, they were pointing to the great cleansing that has happened through the cross, where, where we receive full forgiveness through the blood of Jesus, our slate wiped entirely clean. Do you see how, how actually what Paul is saying here is the temple's now redundant. We, we come to God through Jesus, and that access is open to both Jew and Gentile. So actually what Jesus has done doesn't just get rid of the barrier between us and God, it gets rid of the barrier between these two communities. So I've got a diagram that maybe illustrates this. I like visual things, diagrams and things. I, I was a scientist back in the day, so these things help me. So that's our natural state. Okay? We're, we're cut off from God, and we're cut off from one another. And, and the, you know, the peace comes at, at a cost. 
That was what Jesus achieved at the cross. If we go on to the next slide. You know, at the cross, Jesus destroys those walls and makes way for us to come to God. But what this passage also says is that as we come to God, if we can go to the next slide, we come together. Do you see that? As we draw near to God, we find actually that we're united to one another. You know, I, I would guess, you know, that, that you know, Jew-Gentile is not the big division in our life today, is it? It's not the big division in the world around us. But actually, do you see, what Paul is saying here is that all divisions between us are destroyed at the cross. In verse 15, he says, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. And in that sense, the cross is the great leveler, isn't it? So if we just move on, there's another diagram uh, which I find helpful. So you see these steps at the side. Naturally, all of us rank ourselves, don't we? We find a place for ourselves in society. We take pride in certain things and, and use those things to look down on others. And that could be all kinds of things. You know, it could be class or wealth or family background or Bible knowledge. You know, we use these things, don't we, to work out where we fit. But you see, actually, when we come to the cross, we've got to descend first, haven't we? We've got to leave all those things behind. We've got to acknowledge that they don't count for anything when it comes to coming to God. It doesn't matter where you are on those levels. All of us meet at the bottom. Do you see, there's no, we can't be proud, can we, as we come to the cross? Because to come to the cross is to come with empty hands, to say, Lord, I can't do it. I've got nothing to add. I need to receive from you. Now, for the Jew, this meant you know, their lineage, the temple itself, their circumcision, their ritual purity. That didn't give them advantage. They too had to come to the cross to receive. I, and again, I, you know, for us, that could mean all kinds of things, couldn't it? That makes us think we're okay before God. Our family background. You know, maybe our family's been at Sunbridge for years. Maybe from a family of ministers. Our education. You know, our, our, maybe you know all the right answers in Bible study. Maybe it's our role in the church, our ministry. Maybe it's our wealth or our nationality. Actually, all those things are irrelevant, aren't they, at the cross? At the cross, we all come equal. The uh, image that came to my mind, which might sound strange initially, okay, was that of a hospital gown. So, you know, if you, if you have to go into a hospital for an operation, they very kindly give you one of those lovely kind of open back gowns, don't they? And um, it's very hard to look dignified in one of those, was my experience. And it's very hard to look sophisticated, isn't it, in a hospital gown. And in a way, those gowns are a great leveller, aren't they? Actually, it doesn't matter who you are in the world outside, in hospital, everybody looks the same. You can be right there, you know, someone can be in their bed next to you, and you wouldn't know, would you, your status outside in the world. They might be your, your boss or your boss's boss. You know, they might live in the nice bit of town. It doesn't matter. See how that, that gown is a great leveller, isn't it? And actually, even to go into hospital, you have to humble yourself, don't you? You have to admit that you need help. You've got a problem that you can't sort out on your own. Just to enter a hospital is to humble yourself. And I think in many ways, the cross is like that. You know, when we come to the cross, the only way we can come really is on our knees. By humbling ourselves, by admitting we can't do it. We've got nothing to contribute. We need help. We can't sort ourselves out. And you see how the cross, just like those hospital gowns, is a great equaliser among us. See, at the cross, we have to take off all our fancy clothes. You know, all the things that we take pride in. Isaiah 64, 6 says this. It says, our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Do you see what that's saying? Even our best bits, our good deeds, our service, the things we put on our CV, they're all tainted, aren't they? By selfishness. So actually, when we come to the cross, we have to take all that off. Acknowledge that that doesn't help us get to God. And wonderfully at the cross, Jesus gives us clothes to wear. And you'll be glad to hear it is not a hospital gown. Jesus gives us robes of righteousness. We take off our filthy rags and we're clothed in his righteousness. But you see how actually that unites all of us, doesn't it? After all that, how can we look at another believer in superiority? How can we look down at a brother or sister in Christ? 
See, through Jesus, God is creating one new humanity. Um, Bruce and Lucas and I meet once a week to kind of discuss the preaching that's coming up and just talk about the passages together. And a few weeks back, we were looking ahead to the book of Ephesians and just talking about it. And one of the things Lucas mentioned, you know, obviously Lucas and Letitia have lived in lots of different parts of the world. But one of the things he said is actually wherever they've been, you know, even if the culture is very different, the language is different, you know, they don't kind of look and sound like everybody else. He says one of the things that's always really encouraged him is that when he's with God's people, there's a unity. You know, he finds brothers and sisters in Christ. And even if they only just met, they have something remarkable in common. And I had an experience of that when, um, just before university, I went to Peru with a Christian organization. I've never been that far from home. And uh, one of the things that most encouraged me was though the culture was completely different, you know, the language was different, people ate different things, wore different things. Actually, even though I'd only met some of these people just, you know, just that day, I knew that we were united in a very deep way because of our faith in the Lord Jesus. And actually, I had, I had a unity with them that was more significant than many of my kind of old friends back home who knew nothing of Christ. See, sometimes I think we make the mistake of thinking it's our job as Christians to make unity with one another. Ephesians 2 says, no, God has united us at the cross. He's done it. Our job is just to live that out. So you could, if you wanted, you could sum up Ephesians like this. Okay, chapters 1 to 3, you are united. That's what God's done at the cross. Chapters 4 to 6, so be united. You know, live out what God has done. So just take a moment to look around at one another. Okay? Go on, look around at one another. If you're watching through YouTube, you know, think of people in the church family that you know. We have been united at the cross. We have been united together into one humanity, the new humanity that God is building. You might not know lots of people in this room, but if, if together we are in Christ, we're united. Last week we had the privilege, didn't we, of baptising Martin, uh, Hamed and Saba, um, Maziar, Mustafa. And you might never have actually met them or spoken to them in person. But last week, you know, they confessed, didn't they, to their faith in the Lord Jesus. They identified with him in his death and resurrection. That means actually, even if you've never spoken to them, that, that you are united to them in Christ. They're brothers and sisters in the Lord. They're part of the church family. Or think of um, Phoebe, uh, Sharon's wife. You know, we, many of us have been praying for her. She's um, been trying to get a visa to come from India and join uh, Sharon over here. And she can't be here yet. She's still in still quarantining, but you know, maybe next week she'll be able to join us in person. But again, I don't think any of us have met Phoebe in person, but already we're united to her in Christ. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So our job is to live out that unity. And what that means is we mustn't start re-erecting the barriers of the world in the church. It's so easy to do that, isn't it? Actually, God has united us. He's equalized us, if you like. But it's so easy, isn't it, for us to start building those walls in here. And again, I, I mentioned, I think, some of the dangers of where we might do that. It might be class, you know, our, our background, the kind of job we do, the kind of area we live. It might be our nationality. It might be our gender, our ethnicity. It might be whether we've grown up in church or we're new to all this. That can be a way that we divide from one another. It might be language, you know, whether English is our first language or we speak with an accent. It's so easy, isn't it, for those barriers which exist in the world to start affecting the way we relate in here. And, you know, sadly, our nature is such that we will build walls over the smallest of things. He wears a mask. She doesn't wear a mask. You know, there's a danger at the moment, isn't there, that a wall grows up between those of us who come in person and those of us who, who, who are unable to do that at the moment. Now, I just want to share an encouragement for us here at Sunridge. You know, one of the things that has always excited me most about us as a church, one of the things actually that drew Alice and I to come here uh, to, to Bradford and to Sunridge Road Mission, is actually, you know, in Christ, wonderfully, how diverse we are as a church. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? We're, we're a church of people from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of walks of life. And actually, isn't that a testimony to, to the work of God in the gospel? to what God does through the cross. 
You know, maybe you're, this morning, you're sitting next to someone or, or sitting near someone, it's probably more accurate nowadays, isn't it? Who's not like you at all, who's very different to you. Well, actually, that shouldn't unnerve us or unsettle us. That should thrill us. That should excite us. You know, that shows, doesn't it, what God is doing through the cross. He's bringing together people who'd never normally be together, united in Jesus. And, and you know, it's not just that we're no longer separate, but positively, we are brought into something incredible. So that the, just the last few verses talk about how we're included. We're part of God's building project in the church. Again, just you know, speaking pastorally, one of the things that really makes my heart ache, I think, is when um, you know, there are people in the church who've, who've responded to God's offer of peace through the cross of Jesus, who are trusting in the Lord Jesus, but still they feel like outsiders. Still they feel inferior among God's people for some reason. They feel like foreigners or strangers. Well, wonderfully, do you see what this passage says? Through the cross, all of us have full access. We're fully included in what God is doing. And there's, there's three wonderful pictures of that. Okay, so this is verse 19, firstly. We're, we're citizens, fellow citizens with God's people. If we can have the next picture up. You know, a British passport represents citizenship, doesn't it? You're part of the United Kingdom. And if we've grown up with one of these, it's easy to take it for granted. But, you know, there's, there's a number of asylum seekers among us as a church family. And they long for the day when they might get a British passport. Because it, British passport means security, doesn't it? It means identity. It means being a full part. And through the cross, we are citizens of God's people. We don't just have leave to remain. We've got a passport. The second picture is that of a household. You know, it talks here about being members of his household, of God's household. Now, this is the picture that for me most sums up a household. You know, it's people sitting together around a dinner table. And one of the biggest compliments you can, you can give someone about how they've included you is to say, well, they've treated me like family. You know, it's a picture, isn't it, of intimacy, of belonging, of safety. And this is saying that through the cross, we have a seat at that table. We're part of God's family. You know, we're not just a guest or a visitor that kind of pops in. We're family. And the, the last image that really um, Paul spends the most time on is that of a building project. So he says, you know, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him too, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now, Herod's temple was a glorious building, but it's nothing on what God is building right now. You see, God's current building isn't bricks and mortar, and it's not a skyscraper or a cathedral. It's people. Actually, now it's in the church that he dwells. And I don't mean this room. I mean us as people. We've, the, the title for this series is God's Building Project. And that resonates with the book of Ephesians, but I think also that resonates with where we're at as a church. You know, if, um, for, for us as a church, we've had a build, physical building project kind of present in the background or at times in the foreground for a number of years. And it's easy to think, isn't it, to start slipping into thinking that that is the focus of God's plans for us. And one of the things as elders we've recognized, I think, over this last year is actually there's a far bigger and more important building project that God has to do. And that is the work he's doing in us as a people. That's actually the building work that's going to last, isn't it? Long after any physical new building we might move into. And when you, I suppose when you think of a physical building project, how do you kind of start imagining that? Well, usually it's blueprints, isn't it? Drawings. What about the more important building project of what God's doing in us as a people? How do we imagine that? Well, I think that's what the book of Ephesians is doing. You know, the book of Ephesians is giving us a vision of what God is doing among us, his purposes, his plan. So just imagine with me for a moment. You know, imagine a community where others are always being built in. Those who are without hope and without God are drawn near as they hear the message of peace through the blood of Jesus. 
Imagine a community where we are being aligned with the cornerstone, where our lives are being brought into closer and closer alignment with the Lord Jesus day by day. Imagine a community full of God's presence as he dwells in us by his spirit. Imagine a community that lives out the unity we have in Christ. You know, where people come among us and say it's different here. They're not defined by the normal judgments, the normal divisions of the world. They don't look down on one another. There's no second-class members among them. It's exciting, isn't it, what God is doing? See, our world is still marked by separation and hostility, but God has a plan. God is building a new humanity. And if we want to see where that's going on, we need to focus on the church. And I wonder, do we treat the church like that? This is a pretty big vision, isn't it? You know, one of the reasons I was eager for us to look at the book of Ephesians is I think right now, with all that's going on, there's a danger that we start to see the church like the government does. A leisure activity, an interest group, a place of worship, an event on a Sunday. This is the danger in some ways of lockdown, isn't it? That we reduce the church to something we watch or we attend once a week. Do you see here how the church is much, much bigger than that? And I'm not just talking about Sunbridge Road Mission here. I'm talking about what God is doing all over the world. The church is the new humanity God is building in Jesus Christ. What, what could be more important than that? Surely this is our prayer, isn't it? That in a world marked by separation and hostility, people would come into contact with God's people and say there is hope in the world. God is at work in the world. Let me pray for us. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made peace with us. We know that peace was not cheap. Lord, that peace has come through the blood of your Son. We thank you not only that we have peace with you, that we don't have to scurry away this morning, but we can, we can be in your presence without fear of judgment, but also that we have peace with one another. Lord, that you have united us in Christ. Lord, we praise you for what you are doing, for your building project, and the great privilege that we are a part of that. Lord, would this vision be our vision? Forgive us, Lord God, where we've treated the church lightly or as insignificant. Lord, we pray more and more the way we see these things would match the way you see them. Lord, we, we know that we do not deserve to be a part of this. We don't deserve a passport. Lord, we don't deserve to be at the table. We don't deserve to be part of the building. Lord, what a privilege we have in Christ. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.